when you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, welcome back to the Grease Comedy YouTube channel. Today's video, we're going to be doing John 1, A Clash of Kings, and our reread. This is going to be episode 7. If you have not watched the previous ones, I would highly suggest it as this is a series of rereading through the books. I also just want to say a massive shout out to my Spotify listeners. If you did want to listen to these on Spotify, the link is always in the description if you wanted to check those out. But let's get into the video and the chapter starting on page 7. John begins searching for Sam. He's in basically the library as he notices how old the books and scrolls are. The room smells of paper, dust, and age with dim lighting filtering through from a hidden lamp. So again, just to really paint where we are, just to picture a place where people don't really go to. If you're thinking about it from the idea of, okay, usually only the maesters would go to see the libraries at Castle Black. Maester Eamon can't really even see anymore, so why would he be down here? Plus he's frail. So you really get the scope of how ancient these books and scrolls are. John extinguishes his own lighting to avoid the risk of fire among the dry paper and follows the faint light. Yeah, the last thing you need here is to burn the entire library down, containing thousands of years of history. So yeah, probably not a good idea. But another thing we do know is that John now is wearing black moleskin gloves due to the burn on one of his hands and the other because you just don't wear one glove, obviously. John finds Samuel Tarly sitting at a table in, an, in a niche carved into the stone wall, working by the light of a hanging lamp. John asks Sam if he's been here all night, noting that Sam missed breakfast and his bed was unslept in. So very similar to, say, Tyrion, for instance, in book one, Sam is somebody that has just been enveloped with all these books, all of these histories. This is something that I would personally love, given the fact you have all this, all of this lore, all these things that these books could tell you as Sam's going to kind of talk about. But the fact that Sam, who is somebody that is pretty highborn, he's not used to little, you know, the Night's Watch lifestyle, and here he is, he doesn't even go to sleep and he doesn't want food, tells you how invested Samwell is. Sam is startled by John's question and admits he has lost track of time. John reassures himself that Sam didn't desert despite another person suggesting it, which it is interesting. Like if Sam just goes missing and you come back and it's like he didn't sleep, he didn't eat. Probably the first thing you would think of if it was any other Night's Watchman is, oh yeah, they deserted. Like obviously. And you also think about, it, okay, it's coming in a time where they're about to go north of the wall. A very scary thing could mean the death of all of them, which for a lot of them it will be. You couldn't blame somebody like Samwell maybe trying to desert. But as John like thinks, like Sam doesn't necessarily have the courage to desert. Think about everything John had to do to bring up the courage to actually desert to go south. And you put that into Sam, Sam doesn't have that type of courage yet anyway. Sam comments on how hard it is to tell time in the dim underground space. As John teasingly calls Sam a sweet fool and warns that he will miss his comfortable bed when they are sleeping on cold, hard ground. Again, can't blame Sam for losing track of time, given it is extremely dark down here. But also, yeah, you would think that in Sam's position, he would want to go through his normal routine, actually get a good night's sleep, getting actual good food before setting out. But no, and Sam is definitely going to regret that as he goes through the next two books once they leave Castle Black. Not much, not much goes right for Sam, but that'll get us into page 71. Sam tells John, though, that Mace Draymond had sent him to find maps for the Lord Commander, expressing amazement at the library's vastness and also noting that Winterfell has, has more than a hundred books. Again, it's just somebody like Sam's. This is, this is the best thing that the wall for him, right? If you look at how Sam is as a person, he's very bookish. This would be great to be able to experience all these untouched you know, pieces of history that have probably been forgotten. But also it makes sense that you know, Mace Draymond telling Sam to get the maps, right? Because this isn't a time where we have Google Maps. We can't just go on our phones, go, okay, this is where we need to go. This is all the surrounding stuff and all that. This is Medieval Times, A Song of Ice and Fire. Maps are going to be vital to being able to understand how to navigate beyond the wall. And John even notes and sees that Sam has found several maps, gesturing towards some of the books and scrolls that Sam had found. And even picking one up, he unfolds it, noting its faded paint, but highlighting the marked sites of wildling villages. But for Sam, somebody that knows he could find so much better if given more time, is not exactly happy with his finding. As Sam even like reveals some of the stuff that he's found down here, he think he talks to John about a dusty, a dusty volume written by a ranger named Redwin 
about a journey from the Shadow Tower to Lorne Point. He shares that the book mentions a Doran Stark as king in the north, which indicates it's before Aegon the Conqueror's time. So it would be very interesting, right? You have these people that before Aegon came over, how their lives would have been, how the north would have been run under a king of the north, all those things that could be really interesting, especially as you have the north transitioning to a period where they have a king in the north and Rob. But Sam expresses excitement about the tales of giants and interactions with the children of the forest described in the book. Another thing that's very interesting is that we see that there are interactions between the children of the forest, that at one point, right, the, the human population was being able to have good relations with the children of the forest, something that could be interesting when you think about Bran's plotline kind of going forward. John, trying to kind of encourage Sam, says that he could write a, an account of their ranging. And that's not exactly the thing you want to bring up with Sam. Sam is getting lost in the past and all these great stories and things like that. But when you think about Sam, somebody who doesn't have the most amount of courage at this point of the story, you're reminding him all of all of the horrors north of the wall. What has been involved in these stories? Like he just got set, done saying these tales of the children of the forest, giants. Those are all things Sam would like to read about, but not necessarily have to encounter. John then also examines another scroll that crumbles in his hands, noting its poor condition and faded script. Sam takes the scroll from John, and he is somebody that's like, John, you can't just be, like, touching stuff. These are ancient scrolls that need to be rewritten and not to be messed with by people. And you see the difference of why, you, you see right away why Sam would be such a good maester, because he has those qualities of, you know, caring about, some th uh, caring about things like history that, like, John doesn't necessarily. And Sam tries to tell the importance to that to John, but John just doesn't see it, right? He's like, oh, well, this scroll, all it is is like an inventory, and he doesn't see the relevance that has, right? Having a piece of history and understanding how the world functioned before, right, when there were, you know, more Night's Watchmen, how they were able to live, and Sam's trying to explain all these things to John, but he's just not really getting through to John. John simply puts it up to, they ate, they lived just like we do now, which is not the case. It's very much simplifying history, but that's just John's view. It's, a lot, it's the view of a lot of people. There's a lot of people that don't care about history, and I think that's kind of a shame, but that gets us into page 72. Sam continues, insisting that the vault is a treasure filled with valuable knowledge, but John, again, is kind of doubting this as he associates treasure with kind of more material things, wealth, not old books and scrolls. There is the difference between Samwell and John. I lean way more on the side of Samwell. You can even see George R. Martin, I feel like, using his own writing within Sam. That's why I think Sam and George are the most some of the most comparable characters in the story, just based upon their personalities. But I think you see a little bit of George writing himself here into the Sam character. And then Sam excitedly explains the importance of the vault once again, You know, mentioning the different things or the drawings of the faces in the trees or a book about the language of the children of the forest, or scrolls from old Valyria. It's these things that John is not matured enough to see the value in until, like, you know, later on in the series when this actually becomes very important. It's one of those things where, if you even think about Jack and Hagar, right? And I did this video last week talking about maybe he was trying to get to the wall for these things. Something like a scroll from old Valyria could have a lot of interest to Jack and given the fact that he's looking for stuff on dragons. I think that's interesting to think about here with Sam talking about the stuff he's found in these vaults. But John dismisses Sam's enthusiasm, again, reminding him that the books will be there when they return. And again, and again, reminding Sam that they're going to have to leave, and he grimly responds if, if we return. And that's one of the things is us as book readers, it's going to take a while for these characters to get back to Castle Black after they leave. It's going to take two whole books for them to really get back to Castle Black, and they'll be very different people when they return. John tries to reassure Sam, explaining that the old bear is taking 200 seasoned men, three quarters of them rangers, and that Corrin Halfhand will be bringing another hundred from the Shadow Tower. He tries to assure Sam, you know, saying he'll be safe as if he was in his father's castle at Hornhill. John makes another mistake because, as Sam kind of remarks, and we all know, Hornhill and Reynald Tarly, you know, being in Sam's presence was not very safe either kind of alluding to what's going to happen north of the wall. And John, I think, is kind of looking over how dangerous this mission is going to be. Yes, you have 300 men of the Night's Watch. There are tens of thousands of wildlings out there. There's this threat of the others that's been uncovered. There's so much unknown north of the wall, and the Watch is going to figure that out. Even though they should probably already know those things, 
it's not a good look. I've talked about this. I think Gior Mormon makes a terrible mistake sending like this much of the watch's strength out to north of the wall when they will be basically in a disadvantage in terms of not having the wall to separate them from the wildlings and those things. But let's continue on. John even thinks about how interesting the situation is, right? Where people like Pip and Toad were to remain at Castle Black when they were eager to go on this venture, whereas Sam himself, someone that is a coward and all of that, he is to go north of the wall. But it kind of shows a little bit of how, you know, Sam is, you know, very, you know, a coward. He doesn't have a lot of courage in himself and all that stuff until later. But Sam is also smart to fear all these things. People being eager to go north of the wall, they are, that shows how young these people in the story still are. But John mentions that the old bear is taking two cages of ravens to send word as Maester Eamon is too frail to join them. So Sam must go in his place. It makes sense. You need somebody that can, you know, operate with the ravens, and that has to be Sam. But Sam is desperate to try to get out of it, right? He says that anyone can take care of the ravens, even John or Gren, and offers to teach them how, hinting at, again, his fear of going. And that's just not the case. It takes skill to be able to manage the ravens, you know, send these messages, all those things. And John and Grant are simply not going to have time. They have other duties that they have to do. And so Sam's just going to have to suck it up. And that's basically what John tells Sam. He's pretty much going to have to suck it up. He can't be able to do, you know, Sam's duties. But Sam finally gives in, admitting that he is a brother of the Night's Watch and shouldn't be so scared. And John even re- tries to reassure Sam some more, stating that they are all scared and that only fools wouldn't be. So, but John kind of admits, it. you know, he is a little bit scared as well as he should be. John, remembering his father's words, tells Sam, there's no shame and fear. What matters is how one faces it. We, all, we have this quote really from book one that's very much said in a lot of different ways throughout the story, but, you know, the idea of, okay, you can only be brave when you are afraid. It's, it's kind of that, but just changing the wording a little bit from John. But, yeah, it's a great saying, and that is truth. That'll get us into page 73. Sam still is not the most happy about this, but, he, but Sam nods unhappily, and they walk leaving the vault, as the two go and try and find your Mormon. John reflects on the changing seasons as they climb, recalling the great raven from the Citadel that brought news of Summer's End, the same kind of birds we've been seeing in the prologue, or what Bran sees with the great ravens as well, just to confirm Summer is ending. John even remembers a mild winter from his childhood, but senses that the approaching one will be much harsher. That is the truth. That given the fact that you're seeing bodies being reincarnated and all this stuff, yeah, winter is going to be kind of rough. But by the time they reach the surface, Sam is out of breath, puffing heavily from the climb. As they emerge as well, they also feel the wind on them, and, J- and Ghost joins them as they go to see Gior Mormon. As they both look upon the wall with its, you know, ever-changing color, right? John goes to describe it as being anything from, like, deep blue to dirty white to pale gray. It has a magical kind of effect to it. John even thinks about the wall and the enormity of it. It makes, again, the castle, or I would say this is more like a town. It's not necessarily a castle. As we kind of see later on with the battle for Castle Black, it's not exactly a defendable castle. But it just makes everything else look smaller. And that's the truth. You have this huge wall. Everything else is just going to look minor compared to it. John thinks on the weather as the morning sky is streaked with thin gray clouds, and again, this comet, which the Black Brothers call Mormont's Torch, as it was even visible in the daylight. Again, we just see somebody else bringing up a new name for the comet. I've talked about this pretty much in every chapter, but it's just giving this comet a name that applies to the people there and their beliefs. But they believe that this comet would light the old bear's way through the haunted forest. But John gets them to focus because the old bear wants the maps, and they've taken quite a long time getting them to him. Ghost moves ahead of them, and the grounds of Castle Black seems deserted since many of the rangers had gone to Moldtown, Moldstown visiting brothels and drinking heavily. Yeah, uh, a lot of these people just want to have a good time before they go out to beyond the wall to hell, more or less. So, yeah. But John even thinks about how his friends had wanted him to go as well, but John had declined. John is someone that, again, doesn't want to ever father a child or have that even opportunity because he doesn't want his child to have to go through what he did. And it's something that John's going to be tested on, right? And his vows, right? Because he also wants to keep up his vow. It's not only the bastard part of it, but it's also, you know, John trying to hold his vows, not taking a woman and all that stuff, which will be tested. It's interesting that this is brought up at the beginning of A Clash of Kings because 
going to come for a full circle in a storm of swords. And John even thinks on Sam going, as he is as frightened of whores as he is of the haunted forest, which Sam, being afraid of women, can't blame him. Women are scary. That's all I got to say. You know, Sam, of all the things you're scared of, can't blame you on that one. But that'll get us into page 74. As John and Sam pass the steps, they hear men singing, and John reflects on how different people cope before going into battle or going north of the wall. Some men whore and drink, and others seek the gods. He wonders who feels better afterwards. And it's interesting. It just kind of shows the different things of, of what motivates individuals. For instance, right? If you think about Tyrion and the riddle that he's given by Varys, it's all about the individual. If someone feels armored in the faith that the gods will protect them, that might give them solace in their fears and all that stuff. For people that are maybe drinking, hoarding, it's just a, a way of relieving maybe their stress or taking them out of their thought process of what they're going to have to be doing in the coming days or weeks or whatnot. But yeah. But once again, John feels no temptation. Again, his were the old gods, not the new gods or any of those things. And, and the old gods are more tied to the wild places north of the wall. He will seek them when they go past the wall, right? Going to the new gods when they really don't have much power in John's mind north of the wall, this doesn't really make any sense. Outside the armory, John and Sam see Sir Andrew Tarth. Training new recruits had arrived with Conwy, one of the wandering crows, very similar to Yorin, like we're seeing with Arya at this time. But he had brought a couple of recruits, a gray beard, two blonde brothers, a younger man, a man with a club foot, and a grinning man who fancied himself a warrior. And Sir Andrew is kind of teaching the grinning recruit a pretty harsh lesson. But all these people, you can see that they're not the ideal recruits, right? They either have some issue or a disability or something like that. They're not the perfect people you would want here. It shows, again, the Night's Watch does not bring the best people to the wall. And Sam and John watch them training a little bit. Again, they're not on too much of a haste to get to Gior Mormont, but they, you know, are watching it. Or Donald Noy, the armorer, appears in the doorway and asks John for his opinion on the, cr- the recruits. And John replies, they smell of summer. Which I think is ironic. It's one of those, like, moments where it's like, yeah, John, you've been at the wall for a bit of time now, but... You saying they smell of summer is kind of ironic, John, given that you are still a very young man and you yourself are pretty inexperienced. It's just ironic to me, but yeah. And also, one of them is a much older man than John. I just find this line fascinating. It's always one of those things where John thinks he's kind of grown up and he hasn't really at all. And Danelle Noy explains the recruits were collected from a lord's dungeon near Goldtown, describing them as a brigand, a barber, a beggar, two orphans, and a boy whore. Here are marks on the state of the Night's Watch, defending the realm with such men. Just again, going in circles about the Night's Watch is really not what it once was. John says they'll do, reflecting on how he and Sam had also been inexperienced recruits, and still are. John's trying to age himself up to be cool, but, you know, he's also still a pretty young guy. And Donald Noy pulls John closer and asks if he had heard the news about his brother, Rob. Something we hadn't seen in the last book is how John's going to react to Rob being a king, something that hasn't been seen in the North for 300 years. And how is John going to be affected by that? Here he is, this Night's Watchman, somebody that is going to get no praise or be in any songs, and here's his brother being a king. And John even thinks that he doesn't know how to feel about Rob becoming a king. He reflects on, you know, their shared experiences growing up together, but notes the differences in their fate. Rob will drink from jeweled goblets, while John will be kneeling by streams drinking snow melt. Not exactly the case, as Rob will be in a war and his fate will be pretty bad, but John does have the right of it, right? Like, they're on very separate, different paths. Well, until John comes into Winds of Winter and also becomes a king, more like more than likely. Despite John's uncertainty, though, he backs Rob, saying, saying that he will make a good king. Don Alnoy, however, expresses skepticism. Again, he is a Baratheon man. Let's remember that, and that's very key to what he's about to tell John. He recalls Robert Baratheon and how much he changed after being a king. And he notes how Robert Baratheon was better for fighting, not for ruling. And John asks about Robert's brothers, which is going to be very interesting because he gives one of the most famous lines, especially for people like Stannis, Renly, and Robert. Donald Noy compares the Baratheon brothers to different metals. Robert is true steel, Stannis is iron, strong, but brittle, and Renly is copper, bright and shiny, but of little worth. And 
this is the key point, right? Because you see, as you see, he points out Stannis and Renly specifically the most and kind of elaborates on why they are each metal. Stannis is somebody that's not going to compromise. He's not going to bend, but he will eventually break, as we probably will see in Winds of, Ven- Winds of Winter as well. But Renly, on the other hand, is somebody that's very flamboyant. He looks the part, but is he really the part? Is he the person that should be king? Probably not. That's what Dano- Danelle Noy is saying while putting it in a language that he speaks being an armor. It's one of my favorite lines of this book. And uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to give a little bit of extra time to it. John wonders what Metal Noy would compare Rob to, but decides not to ask. He- and he thinks about the agreement you kind of have with the Night's Watch. You can't take part in, you know, past lives, your families, or politics. It just leads to bad conversations. For instance, in this channel, I don't talk about politics in the real world because it just doesn't lead to great conversations. It leads to people being, you know, very passionate about things and fighting. That's why we don't say those things. And John is kind of basically taking that route as well. John even reflects on Sam's father, Randall Tarley, as the Tarleys are sworn to House Tyrell, who are currently supporting King Renly. And again, he doesn't mention any of this because you don't want to bring up those conversations. But John ends the conversation with Noy, noting that they need to get to Lord Mormont, who is waiting for them. Noy claps John on his shoulder and wishes him well for the morrow, telling him to bring back his uncle, Benjamin Stark. John promises they will, but uh, unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. Mormont, who now resided in the King's Tower after the encounter in Book 1 with the others, but John and Sam leave Ghost with the guards outside as they enter. Sam complains about more stairs, and I will say, Sam, I agree, you know, stair climbing is not the best. It's one of those reasons why Crescent doesn't have very good, you know, hips and knees at Dragonstone. But John notes, on a positive note, they won't have to face stairs north of the wall. But upon entering the Solar, Mormont's raven immediately notices them shrieking snow as Mormont stops his conversation. At this moment, Mormont was in a conversation with Thorin Smallwood, or who is a ranger and a staunch ally of Alistair Thorne, which means he doesn't particularly like John and Sam. And Smallwood is basically trying to convince Lord Mormont that he shouldn't go and that, that he should be the one leading the, the ranging. And on one note, you know, with Smallwood, I do think, you know, having Gior Mormont go north of the wall doesn't really make much sense. And I get why Gior Mormont wants to go, but I actually think that Thorin Smallwood is kind of right in this scenario, that the Lord Commander should be ruling the wall, not doing ranging. But Mormont dismisses Smallwood's suggestion, reminding him that he hasn't died yet and that Smallwood is not in command. But Smallwood doesn't back down once again. He insists that as the new first ranger after the loss of Benjamin Stark and the death of Sir Jeremy, the command should be his. And this is where he strikes a nerve, because Thorne Smallwood hasn't been made first ranger. He is basically trying to get a position that he hasn't actually gotten yet, right? Because they don't know that Benjamin Stark's not dead, even though, realistically, if he hasn't come back yet, he should be dead. Like, I kind of agree with Thorne Smallwood here as well, like, if you okay, let's say I'm not the person you name, but at least name somebody. He's obviously dead. Like in any capacity, he's probably dead. Or at least name somebody that is a temporary person in charge. But I I don't know. I am not the biggest fan of Gior Mormont's decisions in this book. So you can kind of tell right of the way right away as my demeanor against him. And Mormont, you know, getting into page seventy six. He talks about how he doesn't want to, like, sit back anymore. He's been sending people out, and you know, Waymar, Royce, and Benjamin Stark, and they didn't come back. He wants to know what's going on specifically. They're hearing rumors of, you know, the wildlings gathering. They've, you know, had an attack on the wall with the others. He wants to know what's all going on, and I've pointed this out many times. Jior Momot does know what's going on. The information that he's, like, asking, he knows the information is true. The others have come back. They are a thing again. And also that the wildlings are gathering and are going to eventually strike for the wall. Like, I, I just am somebody that does not really like Jorah Mormont's rationale here, but whatever. Jorah Mormont continues to basically berate Thorin uh, Smallwood, basically, you know, saying, you know, you're not first ranger. Get out of my, get out of my, stop wasting my time with this and we're going to ride at first light. And that's basically all he says. And Smallwood kind of leaves. Even after Smallwood leaves, the old bear still keeps going, talking on uh, Thor and Smallwood and all that stuff. Even questions like John and Sam, do I look old to them? 
and John, it's funny because like even in his head, he's like, I mean, you do kind of look old in his head, but he doesn't say. Sam was too scared to even really speak. The old bearer terrified him. But John quickly said, no, he did not. And he says, you look as strong as, but he is cut off. Mormont doesn't want him to soften the blow, and he just says, let's have a look at these maps. Mormont's not really pleased with the maps that Sam finds either, because these maps seem to be a little too old and outdated, and he begins to kind of complain to Sam. And Sam, you know, not being able to really talk to Mormont, says, you know, there were more, but the library's basically in a disorder, which again, Mormont cuts him off, saying that they are too old. But John backs Sam like usual, saying that the villages may come and go, but the hills and rivers will be in the same places, which is true, right? It's like, for instance, if you're looking at America and you were trying to use a map from the 1800s and it's the 1900s, well, it's like the geography is still kind of the same, but you're just not going to know where anything like is in terms of civilization. Mormont then asks Sam if he has picked out the ravens yet. Sam, again, stuttering the whole time, says that Maester Eamon meant to pick them come even fall after the feeding. Mormont wants his best and smartest birds. Because Mormont says if they are to be butchered north of the wall, he means for his successor to know where and how he died. Mormont already realizing that it's very likely that they could all be killed, not a great sign from your commander-in-chief, but it is a smart strategy, right? You do want them to be able to know what happened to you, so you're not in a situation like Benjen or Waymore Royce where they don't know what happened at all. And this talk from Mormont basically makes Sam even more frightened, as he's saying that they might get butchered. Mormont then basically dismisses Sam quite harshly, in my opinion, as he tells him to leave or to go help Maester Eamon, as he probably has work for him. And Sam leaves quite quickly, as that'll get us into page 77. After Sam leaves, Lord Commander Mormont asks John if Sam is truly as foolish as he appears. The raven squawks, fool. And maybe Sam is a little bit of a fool right now, but he will grow into a different person. But Mormont continues kind of talking to John without really getting any responses, reflecting on sending Thorin Smallwood to Renlund, but decides against it, planning instead to send Sir Arnold, as he is more dependable and related to the Fossaways. Again, trying to just gain any type of support for men from King Renling. And John even questions this. What did you know he want from King Renly? Because why would you be sending stuff to Renly, not Rob? Rob's a king. It's kind of just John subconsciously being defensive of, I think, Rob and wanting to know what Mormont's doing. And Mormont just basically responds with doing what he sends to every king, right? That they need men, they need supplies, whatever they can get. They're basically begging, and they're not too prideful to not do that. Mormont then continues noting that Alistair Thorne should be arriving at King's Landing soon, but doubts that King Joffrey will listen, since House Lannister has never been a friend to the Night's Watch. The Lannisters, one, are not going to be a big fan of just the Wall in general, because it's way over in the north, it's out of the way, why bother? And also, they don't really care that much about the Old Gods, any of that stuff, so they're not exactly friends to the Watch, and especially given that now the north is breaking away from the kingdom. But John kind of counters this. Won't they have to take it seriously because of the White's hand that they sh are showing for proof? Now, this is my issue with this quote-unquote proof. It's a, just a hand. You can just say it's a rotted hand from any old body or corpse. Like, I don't know how that's really proof, but I think they kind of didn't really realize that that well. Mormont had wished that they had another hand that they could have sent to Renly, but they did not, unfortunately. Mormont even jokes about Diwin's tale of finding anything beyond the wall, including a 15-foot bear, and compares it to a rumor that his sister once took a bear as a lover. Despite these theories, he admits that he believes his eyes, having seen the dead walk, but never giant bear. Mormont asks John about his burned hand, and John shows him the healing scars and mentions the itching, which Maester Eamon says is a good sign. I mean, he still has feeling and usability of his actual hand. He also shares that Eamon gave him some salve for their journey. Mormont continues investigating John's hand, if he can still wield his sword Longclaw, and John confirms that he can, though he works his fingers daily as Eamon instructed to keep them nimble. Mormont praises Eamon's knowledge and prays the gods let, let them keep him for another 20 years. Then surprised John by mentioning that Eamon might have been king. This isn't very public knowledge, right? 
This is something that Eamon wouldn't have told that many people or many people would have known about, but the fact that Eamon was possibly going to be a king. So a lot to unpack here, right? Because Eamon is extremely intelligent, like, you know, Mormont says. But the fact that he could have been king is interesting because it really connects to John, somebody that now is also going to be basically a half-brother to a king. It's a really a big reflection of what we saw kind of in book one with Eamon having to keep up his vows while watching his family die. It's something that John's also going to have to do as well. John is surprised by this as Eamon had told him his father was king, but John thought Eamon was the younger son. And he was, but unfortunately, a lot of bad things happened to House Targaryen. Mormon explains that Eamon's father, Makar, was the youngest son of King Daron II Targaryen, the one who brought Dorne into the realm. Eamon was Makar's third son, and Mormon notes this all happened long before he was born. John recalls that Eamon was named after the Dragon Knight. So yeah, we're getting just a lot of lore. A lot of stuff about kind of the Blackfire Rebellions and getting into that kind of the Dunkin' Egg time period. A lot of lore. A lot of lore dumping of Eamon's past and of kind of the Targaryen dynasty. But Mormont even continues noting this idea that, okay, that Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight might have been the father of Daron the second Targaryen, but instead of being a great swordsman, Aemon was more intelligent. He was more of a bookman, kind of similar to Sam, as he was sent to the Citadel as a boy due to his quick wits and lack of martial nature. Aemon was around nine or ten years old when he left for the Citadel, and at that time, right, if you think about you know him being nine or ten, there was no chance that the throne was ever going to come, for, come to him. That's what he might, must have been thinking at this time. And unfortunately, things don't go well for his family. Mormont reflects on Eamon's age now that he must be over 100 years old. Mormont then kind of recounts a, tra- a couple of tragic deaths in the Targaryen family. Baelor breaks Spears' death, and then Eris after him. He didn't have really any heirs or any of that stuff. We see how the crown passed. To Makar and then his sons as well. Baylor Breakspear's death, uh, you know, his sons then not following after him. It went then to Eris, and then after Eris, it went to Makar, Aemon's father, and then after that, you saw a number of different deaths happen. You saw Daron, um, Aemon's oldest brother, die. Arian, his his second older bro- oldest brother, die as well. Both of them leaving, you know, heirs behind, but one being a girl and another one being named Magor and being a baby when Makar dies as well. So you had a a situation in which the best claims really were Aegon, his younger brother, Aegon V, himself, Aemon, who was a maester, and basically a girl and a child. And so the crown kind of came down to possibly being Aemon. And John is even confused for a second, right? Because it's mentioned, you know, Aerys I during his reign, and John thinks that that's Eris the second, just based on, you know, okay, Aemon's still alive, so it had to be a somewhat recently, but no, Mormont says it is Eris the first. But even during, you know, his father's rulership, he had wanted Aemon on his council, but Aemon had refused, believing it would, res- it would usurp the role of the Grand Maester, which, which Aemon is very smart to believe. That would have put a big target on his back and shows how smart he was, but instead he served his eldest brother, Daron, but that brother also died as well, as Daron's death was probably from a pox contracted from a whore. We all know about what happened to Arian, and I already mentioned it, so I won't go back through it, but you come to the situation as we get into page 79, where at the Great Council, they tried to basically subtly give the crown to Aemon before he refused, and when that occurred, it was chosen that Aegon V would become king. And you can understand why I think especially the High Septon and people would have wanted Aemon to become king because he was show, he did show a lot of intelligence, but if you're going a maester conspiracy route, Aemon was someone that was very much indoctrinated into their culture. And so of all the Targaryens to rule next, Aemon would be the best option if you're thinking at it from an old town maester conspiracy side of it. Also, you've got to think about from this, Aegon V is kind of a weird kid. Right, He goes around with with the hedge knight or dunk and somebody that people wouldn't have known that well. He would have not lived like a prince or even be prepared for rulership to begin with. He has somebody the highborn people probably would not have liked. And Aemon goes a step further because after Aegon is made king, Aemon chose to come to the wall with Bloodraven. He didn't want to be a rallying point for people that didn't like Aegon to back him instead. He's taking a life that is not grand at all, right? Going to the wall, going to the cold winter to live out the rest of his days as a maester to the wall, not a great life, but it shows his dedication to his family, 
and how intelligent he is. And I think he would have been a great king. All of these things that Mormont mentions are indicators of how intelligent he was, even politically as well. Mormont's raving, even at this time, which sits on his shoulder, cause king. And this is interesting because it says it in John's presence, somebody that I believe will be probably become king of the North in the next book, kind of similar to the show. And if not, he will have a claim to becoming king of Westeros as well if he is a Targaryen. But yeah, again, I think a little bit of Three-Eyed Crow slash Bloodraven meddling, as we will see more in the story. Finally, Mormont gets to his point. Just like we saw with Book 1, Mormont tells things to Jon for a reason. They are usually to manipulate him or make him feel some sort of way. Whether that's good or not, that's usually why he does these things. And so he says that Aemon and Jon are, again, have a lot of things similar to them. And we're not even talking about blood, right? Because I think Jon is a Targaryen. So not only do Aemon and Jon share that, they also could share a name. That's something as well that maybe if John was named Aemon, he could share a name with him as well. But you think about their circumstances, right? Where John has gone to the wall when his half brother or brother in Aemon's case became king and he had to live at the wall, right? He had the worst life, you know, all those things. That's kind of the parallel that Mormont is bringing to the table. Mormont notes that Rob will be dressed in fine clothes, marry a beautiful princess, and have children, while John will wear black ringmail, never marry, and serve rather than rule. All of these things are actually not really that correct, right? If you think about Rob's life, it's not going to go that way at all. And John may become a king eventually. If you even think about his Storm of Swords arc, where he's offered to basically become Lord of Winterfell, very interesting that at this point it doesn't seem likely that John could maybe reverse that, but it will seem like it could happen. Mormont continues trying to put salt in the wound with with John, as Mormont emphasizes that while Rob will be addressed as your grace, John will be referred to as a crow, highlighting and once again the contrasting fates of the two brothers. As we get into page eighty, and Mormont just can't stop; he just keeps going on as the singers will glorify Rob's achievements while John's significant deeds will go unnoticed. He asserts that if John claims this doesn't trouble him, he is lying. Mormont's getting to, again, the heart of the issue, right? He wants to make sure that John isn't going to try to desert or any of these things, that he is a Night's Watchman, not a Stark. John responds defensively, emphasizing the challenges of his status as a bastard and questioning what he can do about it. That's the perfect response. John can't do anything about it. Right? Even if he was to desert, what does that mean? Oh, maybe he'll have a place at court, but he'll never be a king? It doesn't really matter. And it also kind of goes to the idea that John is still someone that is struggling with his identity. It's really what his arc from here to A Storm of Swords is going to be about. Right? It kind of started in book one, and book one is more of a, okay, pick a side, pick a lane, right? Are you going to help the Starks? Are you going to help the Night's Watchmen? This is going to get even further into that in terms of, you know, when we find out about the wildlings and how that, you know, really impacts who he is as a person. And when it comes to his offer he gets by Stannis in book three, this is really the beginning of that second part of identification for John. Mormont then presses him further, asking what he plans to do with his feelings of kind of turmoil. John is clear, though. He will keep his vows and stay in the night's he is picking duty and honor over any emotions that he may have. And that ends the chapter. So thank you guys all for watching. And again, I want to say thank you to my Patreons and members, also Spotify listeners and people watching on YouTube. And also I did want to say, and uh, yeah, I think this is a great chapter, a uh, great starting point for John to establish more of his journey with Sam going on in this book. And I, I think part of it that I think is interesting is unveiling more of Eamon's history because you got to remember now that you know we've gotten much more of the history of this world and all that stuff stuff like this isn't really a big reveal like for me right like like reading all that stuff it's like yeah I, I read all this stuff in Dunkin' Egg and the World of Ice and Fire book and all that stuff and so it had lessens its value like went on a reread but if you're thinking about it from a first read point of view the first time you read this chapter these would have been huge things that Eamon could have been a king and kind of the histories behind the Targaryens. It builds out a bit of the world um, of the Targaryen dynasty specifically. So thank you guys all for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, guys.